Well, good morning and happy Sunday. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today for our Sunday teaching. Um, I know it's been a while since a video came out. Uh, I recently, uh, about a month and a bit ago, we welcomed in our fourth child into our family. And so I've been off uh, for a number of weeks um, taking care of children uh, at home and, and helping out with my wife and whatnot. But I'm back. Uh, we are back, and so uh, let's take a look. Today we're going to continue our look into 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses 9 to 12 today. It's kind of a lighter text. Uh, it's an important text, that's for sure, uh, but it's a lighter one in a way. Reading from the English Standard Version, it says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we, pro while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That's our text for today. Uh, to remind you a little bit, because I know it's, it's been a while and it's always good to refresh on the context. Uh, the context of what we're looking at here is Paul comes to Thessalonica and he preaches and he debates and he gains a following of God-fearing people, mostly Gentile people. Uh, and this becomes the church of Thessalonian, or Thessalonica, known as the Thessalonians. Um, and so, however, his enemies followed him. There's a group of people that did not like Paul, did not like Christianity, did not like the things that he was up to. And they liked to follow him and try and attack him and get him arrested and cause problems everywhere he went and stick behind and accuse him of things and whatnot. So these people got the city in an uproar, and in the midst of that, Paul has to, and his partners, has to flee on to the next city. However, he's writing back to the church that he was able to spend at least some amount of time. We're not quite sure how much time, but he spent a, enough time to teach them and instruct them and establish the church there in Thessalonica. And so someone is there, and they're trying to destroy his work. We don't know who it is. We don't know specifically what it is they've said about him or what they're accusing him of, but they're trying to destroy his work. They're trying to turn the church away from truth. And so in this letter, Paul makes a defense, yes, of the gospel, but also of himself and his own character. In the previous text that we looked at, uh, verses 7 and 8, um, Paul highlights how they came to please God, that they didn't come to use tricks or deception, that they weren't motivated by greed or personal gain, um, but that they were Gentile. And he, or not Gentile, they, they were gentle. And he uses the imagery of a nursing mother with her children. Uh, he spoke of the love that he has for the church. And really, this is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful description. He reflects and he reminds them of the love that he has for them, which is fueled by his love for God. Uh, really, I think this summarizes the pastor's heart. The, the pastor's heart, when, when he's in a proper place and a proper motivation, it's out of a love for God that he responds to the call of God. And he ministers to the people because he loves God and they're his people, um, but also he, he comes to love them um, as well. And, and care for them deeply. And we've talked before about that. But I, I think it's a beautiful thing. I'm a little bit biased as a minister. Um, but I think it reflects it quite well. And then in today's text, he highlights even more how he desires not to be a burden to the people. Right? He doesn't want to be a problem to them. And he talks about how well he was there and he was establishing the church. That he, uh, he took it upon himself to support himself. Now he had some help from the church in Philippi, but he supported himself and so that he wouldn't be a burden upon the people. The text opens, it says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. See, Jewish boys, uh, they grew up learning a trade, right? Jesus grew up learning to be a carpenter, as was his father. 
And Paul, although yes, he's an academic, um, that would have came later in his life, the academia side of things. And so he did learn a trade. He was a, a tent maker. And so he would make tents or he would take animal fibers and whatnot and use those to make the fabrics for tents. And then he would be able to take that product and sell it at the market. And so it's likely that this is what he was doing while he was in Thessalonica. So he worked and when he wasn't working, he worked. So like he, he taught and he preached and he proclaimed the gospel and he walked with the people and answered their questions and debated and, and all this stuff and established the church. And in the midst of doing that, which is in and of it itself a full-time job, he also worked laboriously um, towards making these products so that he'd be able to, to pay. He worked hard. It says he toiled day and night and some people would take this idea that he he worked as a side gig so that the church there, the Thessalonians, wouldn't have to financially support him. They would take this and use it to support this idea that those in ministry should not be paid, um, which hopefully sounds like a weird idea to you. Um, but there are those out there who hold it. Uh, thankfully, in this church, I haven't come across uh, any of that yet. Uh, however, I have encountered it out in the world and online forums and, and other things like that where people have this idea. Um, let's dismiss that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 4 to 12, it gives a strong defense to the minister being paid. Uh, so Paul, once again, he says, Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take a lawn and believe in wife? As do the other apostles or the brother and the brother of the Lord and Cephas, which is Peter. Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Or serve, who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of the fruit? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law also say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher should thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not made use of this right but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. And yet, so Paul here is saying that they have this right, that they should be taken care of, they should be rewarded, uh, that they should be paid for their work. Um, however, for their sake, um, he doesn't do that. He gets financial aid from other places. And he does his work on the side in tent making that he worked while he worked. Um, and yes, as I said, he got support from the church in Philippi. It was very little, but it does, it did help. And this actually does have its place in modern church today where we could have smaller churches uh, and maybe they share a pastor where he's here, you know, on Sunday and then Sunday afternoon he goes there and, and there's that side of things. But there's also the side where larger established churches where they have more resources are able to financially support smaller churches that might need help in that way. Um, and that's something we see across our district. It's something that we take part in here. There's some churches um, that we have supported in the past and there's some that we currently support and other ministries um, to help them financially so that they can have uh, proper care for the people that are ministering to them. But Paul is willing to take a loss for the sake of the gospel. And this is a beautiful thing, and this is a proper thing. Well, a worker is worth his wage, as Luke 10.7 tells us. Um, but the worker for the kingdom shouldn't let the wage become his motivation. And shouldn't let one's wage become the, the crux of, well, I didn't get paid this week, or I don't like my salary, so I'm not going to minister to this person. Like, that's... That's a ridiculous thing. And if that's happening, that person shouldn't be in ministry. Um, we, we should serve the kingdom of God. We should serve the church out of a love for God. And be grateful for everything that comes to our plate, yes. 
but not let that be the motivation. And if you need to find another way to support your family, then you can do that. But if you're called to ministry, um, that should not become the motivation. The, mo the motivation should not be money. Never should be. The love of money is a very, very dangerous thing. And we've seen time and time again where ministers start to love money and very quickly it changes how they operate and it can lead to moral failure very quickly. There's also the idea of new ministries and the support of the bigger church. If you're coming to Thessalonica and there's no church there and you're establishing a church there, how will, how can you be financially supported by something that doesn't yet exist or is in its infancy? Um, and that's where the bigger church, like the church in Philippi, is able to step in and say, hey, we are, we're able to help in this area. As you get things rolling, we're here to help you. Um, because we see the bigger picture of the church. It's not just all about our little situation that we're in, but we can see the bigger picture. The motivation of our kingdom work should not be from a place of greed or personal gain. right? We are building up the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of Chris. And so we, we need to have that emphasized in our living um, that we're, we're not building up our own kingdom. It's not about me. It's not about greed. It's not about what I can gain, what I can get out of a situation. But how can I serve God and be willing to make sacrifices, be willing to take a loss in order um, that the will of God might be promoted more. There's that. The text continues. It says, you are witness and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. He calls to memory his conduct while he was with them. Likely his enemy, this accuser, is attacking his character. And Paul is able to defend that because his conduct was right. It was proper. It was blameless. His actions testified to his character. See, there's people out there and they can say all the right stuff but their living doesn't match up. They have well-crafted speeches, but they also have scandal after scandal. They say one thing and they do another. This is not Paul, and it should not be us either. We should stand for righteousness, we should promote righteousness, and then our living should also back that up. I'm reminded of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel's a story from the Old Testament, and uh, he's there, he's in this foreign land, but he's serving the government. And the, uh, the ruler really takes a liking to him. He becomes his favorite very quickly. Now, obviously, the other government workers don't like that. And so they're like, you know what? Let's watch him. If we watch him long enough and hard enough, uh, we'll find out something that he's doing wrong that we can catch him on. And so they did. They observed him and watched him. And then they realized this guy is blameless. There's nothing we can catch him on that we could get him out of the situation. So they go to the ruler and they say, hey, you should make a law that no one can pray to anything or anyone except to you. And he's very proud, arrogant. Uh, so he decides to go through with that. Yeah, let's make this law. That sounds good to me. I'll put my seal on it. It's decreed because they knew that Daniel prayed three times a day. And so what they did is they took something that was righteous and they made it unrighteous in order to trick him, in order to, to catch him. And so uh, if, if you know the end of the story, he does get arrested because of that. He gets thrown into the lion's den. God delivers him from the lion's den. The king comes down and he's like, Daniel, has your God delivered you? And he has. He, he lives through the night and it changes the whole culture of that place. And God is glorified and it's a wonderful story. But the people were only able to catch Daniel by taking what was good and labeling it bad. And, and that's the only way that they should be able to catch us. Um, we should pursue righteousness. We should pursue proper living and good conduct to the point where there's no accusation that can be made against us unless they pervert what is actually good. I'm reminded, I heard a I forget who it was. I think it might have been Billy Graham, but I can't say for sure. But a, a very popular uh, major preacher, a quote where he said, don't let me, a prayer. He, he said he would do often, of, don't let me do something today that will undo all that I have done. See, the, the conduct of, of a minister is very important. And I can see times in, in the big picture 
where someone has had a massive moral failure and the pain that comes from that ripples through society. And I can see it in my own life of, of people who, as I was growing up, um, promoted the gospel to me, trained me and taught me and, and, and you know, encouraged me and exhorted me and, and comforted me and all these other things uh, and charged me. Um, and then they had a moral failure. And it, it, it echoes out into society. It echoes out because you were entrusted. It's a tragic anytime it happens, but more so with those in the ministry. And truly, as the Bible says, those in ministry, those that are teachers, pastors and whatnot, will be held to a higher standard. In James chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. We should be righteous because it's the good thing to do. It glorifies God and because our actions affect others. Realize this. You do not live in a vacuum. Your life affects a multitude of people. Your poor conduct hurts people. It really does. And if you don't have a good character, and if your conduct then is poor, you are being a poor representative of Christ and you are damaging the reputation of the kingdom of God. And there's people who look at those who say Jesus is Lord and their life doesn't reflect that at all. And they look at that and it makes them disgusted with Christianity. And where there should be desire, there's repulsion. Uh, and that's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. So be righteous. We are, we are called to be ambassadors of heaven. Little Christ. It's not a minor change. It's something that should have a massive impact on you. It should be the core, the foundation of who you are. The Bible uses language that we are to have a renewed mind, that we go from death to life, that we are a new creation. That's not a small change. That's a massive change. And so in that, yes, we stumble and we wrestle with sin, but we should be able to come out and say, that was wrong of me. That was not right. I'm pursuing righteousness. I'm sorry for what happened there. And, and to be able to, to move day by day, getting closer um, to perfection. We are to call to have a culture of heaven that we're passing through, that this world is not our own. But so many people don't act as an ambassador. They act as a settler. They act as an immigrant who is looking to adopt the ways of this new land. That's not what we're called to. John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Are you of this world or are you the kingdom of God? In Philippians 3, 17 to 20, uh, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the examples you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glorify in their shame with mindset on earthly things. But our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't reflect the ungodliness of this world, but rather reflect the culture and kingdom of heaven. And so let your conduct reflect heaven and not earth, God's righteousness and not the ways of the world. Think of the Lord's prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so take inventory of your life. What needs to be pruned? What needs to be removed? How are you doing in representing Christ? How is your conduct? How is your character? How is your heart and how is your mind? And one of the great things we can do when we're looking at this is to look at the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit that naturally will grow in those who are following Christ and submitted to Him. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are these growing in you? And when you have moments of sit these situations that take place, do you look and say, did I exercise self-control? Did I exercise con, um, kindness? Was I, was I peaceful in that? Was I joyful in that? Was I gentle in that? Was I faithful in that? And if the answer is no, to bring correction in your own life. Especially, especially those of you who have people who look up to you as a spiritual mentor, who look up to you as a spiritual leader, whether you're the father of your home or you're leading a small group or you have younger Christians underneath you or, or whatever it is. If you have people 
who spiritually depend on you, um, don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly at all. It's a huge responsibility. It's an honor and a responsibility. Now, as we said in the previous text, Paul refers to his efforts to the Thessalonians as a nursing mother. In this text, he comes out with a complimentary side. He says, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you uh, and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is such a good example. It's like a father with his children, right? A father with his children is a phenomenal example. Not a teacher with his student or a manager with his worker or a coach with his player or a judge with his defendant, but a father with his children. Um, the joy of fatherhood. I, I now have four children. Um, and, and being a father is so much different than I ever would have thought it would have been. Um, I'll say this for those of you who are are young and maybe haven't started a family yet and you're wondering about, well, how will I know if I'm ready to have a child and you're, you and your wife are there and you're trying to figure that out, you're not going to know. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to feel ready. And e- even now I can look back at when we had a, our first child to now and see um, such growth in parenting, such growth in fatherhood. Um, and uh, a father with his child is a very very unique and special thing the sacrificial nature of a good father um, the desire to see your child progress and to grow and this love um, this hopeful love that goes uh it goes beyond so so much it's just it just naturally overflows you and there's the role of a fatherhood of of sternness and charging and encouragement and all that stuff and it's very important and there's times i can think of in my life where i'm sitting you know i'm sitting on the couch or something at home and i hear something happening down the hall or i hear something happening downstairs or outside or whatever and it's like all right time to be a dad and you got to get up and and go and and see what my children are up to and strongly advise them on something right exhort or i come to them and i encourage them in what they're doing lily uh, our daughter was trying to climb a tree and she was trying to get her head above the top of the tree. Um, and she's like, oh, the branches are too small. And so I encouraged her, I'm like, oh, no, you can do it. And then gave her some advice on how to hold the tree that she could get up. And, and then she did. And it was it was exciting. She was beaming with, with pride and excitement about it. Um, and then there's, you know, encourage them or tr- as they try to do th- new things, whether it's climbing or playing an instrument or riding a bicycle or reading bigger sentences and bigger books and whatnot and times where I come to them and I have to charge them with something. Hey, we don't do that. I don't care what they do at school. We don't do that. I don't care that so-and-so down the street that they watch that show or they play that or they say that word or they think this way. We don't do that. And I'll say to them, you know, oh, you know, you're low. And in this household, we don't do that. Um, and all of these things that we do are done in love. In fact, even the punishments, uh, as we give punishments to our children, they should be done in love. It's a side note. Don't punish your children when you're angry. Don't discipline your children when you're angry. Try, try and come into that with a sober mind. Um, but Proverbs 13, 24 tells us, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now, we're not saying beat your children. Certainly not that. People have taken that the wrong way. Um, but we are called to discipline them. We are called to punish them. And there needs to be that. And, and truly, it's in love that we do that. This isn't always the case. Ex- abuse does exist and neglect exists and it's awful, but that doesn't mean that sternness and discipline doesn't have its place. Paul says that he acted like a father towards them. He exhorted them He to mean he strongly encouraged. And I really don't like the English language because we have this, which means to strongly encourage, as in like to guide them in their behavior of, hey, this is how we should do this. And then there's encouraged as in like, you can do it and like a kind of a, a comforting kind of way. And then there's charging them that, hey, we don't do that. We, you know, 
that's not how we are to behave. And we can see examples of this. I mean, Paul's letters are a prime example of how he would exhort people, where he would strongly encourage them and say, this is how we're meant to be, and, and you can do this, and I've heard that this is happening, and he would bring correction. And then there's comforting the church about, you know, those who have died, that we don't mourn as those who have no hope. And then there's times, you know, Paul confronts Peter, for example, where he comes and he charges him and says, hey, you're in error. This is wrong. This is not proper. And in love, all three of these things, in love, because we want the best for the child. And people misunderstand this. There's a lot of folks out there who have church hurt, is what they call it. Um, but the reality is, is no, you were just disciplined by the church because you came and you said, Jesus is Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you, I'm going to do what you want. And then you did opposite to that. And then the church came, church leadership comes and says, hey, that's sin. Like you, you, you can't be doing that if you're of the kingdom. You can't be doing that if you're going to follow God. And you took that as a personal attack instead of them trying to help you. Um, so there's that. The, there's a difference, right, between the father and the mother. There's a gentleness in the mother. There's a sternness in the father. The, the comforting of milk, the substance of steak, both have their place. Both are of value. And so if you're part of our church and, and I come to you or Pastor Tim comes to you, and if you're not part of our church, you should be part of a church. And in that church, when your pastor comes to you, um, Maybe coming with comforting, nurturing, gently teaching the word like a nursing mother to her child. Or we come to you and we give you strong advice on something. We encourage you that, hey, you can do that. You need to hold on to the Bible. You, you can be godly and work and, and do these things and care for your family. Or we come to you in discipline. You can't be doing that. That's sin. That's, you're in error. Hey, do you see how this is wrong? Do you see how the path that this is going to lead on to you? As a father with his children, it's proper and it is in love. It's for the children of God that he has entrusted to us. And so it's a, it's a proper thing. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, which is, we now use the term pastors, uh, and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and defeatful, deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking from truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint, with which is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so as it builds itself upon love. And so here's the idea. The, the God has given the church pastors and, and these other offices in order to grow the church. It uses the term shepherds. And shepherds would have a staff, and the staff would have many purposes. Sometimes the staff is used to beat down the wolves to get them rid of. But a lot of the staffs have a spike at the end. Uh, which would be called a goad. And, and as you were leading the sheep, sometimes you'd have to push them a little harder. I have chickens at home, and, and sometimes I have, to, I have this big stick that I guide them around with. And sometimes I just need the stick to be near to them to guide them. And sometimes I need to move them a little bit with a bit more force. But the idea of the goad is when, when the animal would kick back, it, it would hurt. And it would kind of teach them a lesson of you know why the shepherd is here and that's where we get the biblical phrase from it's hard to kick against the goat um, because God has given us shepherds uh, giving us shepherds to bring instruction and guidance and discipline uh, and so often people will try and push against that as if it's there to harm them when it's actually to their benefit and so as you lead people in whatever capacity that is be a good example May your guidance, may your encouragement, may your discipline be biblical and done out of love. That's our text for today. And I was trying to figure out how best to close it, um, to, to close the teaching. And I think it's just simply prayer. And so I know this is going to be pre-recorded, uh, but I would encourage you to pray along. Um, dear Lord, 
I thank you for you are good. I thank you, God, um, for my brothers and sisters, and I pray that you would just help us to be good leaders for you, uh, pursuing wisdom, pursuing knowledge, uh, that we would honor you in all that we do. Um, Pray for those in leadership that you would give them wisdom and guidance. God, help us to have good conduct, to know what is right. We love you, Lord. Amen. Have a great week. Honor God in all that you do. May he be glorified in your conduct, in your speech, and in your discipline.